welcome to the south of Costa Rica. Join me over the next week as we visit some absolutely amazing places. Starting out today at Wilson's Botanical Gardens. I'm here just outside the library. It's right around dawn. You can probably see the sun is starting to hit more directly on my face. I've been out since about four in the morning looking for owls this morning. In particular, there's a really cool kind of owl that can only be found here in the south of Costa Rica. Right now, it's classified as the Choco Screech Owl. Choco is a region in the northern part of South America. But theoretically, the Choco Screech Owl doesn't really come this far north. It usually stays from eastern Panama and into South America. But the owl that's here doesn't really fit the description of any other owl in Costa Rica. So a lot of people I've talked to that are knowledgeable on the subject have said it's very likely that it's going to be a new species. And I was able to briefly see it this morning, along with two other owls. The botanical gardens here are really neat. Uh, they were founded in 1962 by a couple from Miami, Florida that decided to leave the states and take over a abandoned coffee plantation here in the south of Costa Rica. Together with a friend that they met who was a Brazilian landscape architect, they started laying out these gardens. And eventually, after a few years, an English-Australian industrialist decided to help fund the project. After a few more years, it was bought by the Organization for Tropical Studies, the OTS, that maintains three of the most important research centers in Costa Rica, this being one of them. This is an amazing spot for biodiversity. There's over 400 bird species, um, over 2,000 species of native plants. There, there's an incredible amount of plants, both uh, imported and exotic, because it's a botanical garden, but an amazing amount of natural biodiversity that's uh, endemic or, or common here in the local area. So right here is an about 12 year old palm tree. But this palm tree is special because it's the uh, child of the very first palm tree that was here at these botanical gardens. If we walk a little bit back here, just over here following me, you can see this burry palm that comes from Brazil. And it was the very first plant to be introduced here to Wilson's Botanical Garden. Since this is now a research center rather than a botanical garden, well, it's still a botanical garden, but now it's owned by a tropical research station, they're no longer importing exotic plants. And when exotic plants die off, they generally don't replace them with another exotic plant. But since this was the very first tree, they uh, were able to capture some seeds from this palm and plant that other one. But this garden at one point had over 700 palm species. It still has over 500, making it the second uh, highest number of palm species of any botanical garden in the world. The first is in Florida. In fact, this botanical garden has a lot of species, over 3,000 species, making it the botanical garden that has the most number of species, the greatest collection in all of Central America. So I'm here with another really interesting plant. We were just talking about the variety of palm trees they have here. And if you looked at this, you would think this is another type of palm. But actually it's not. It's a very uh, primitive type of plant. It's actually most closely related to conifer trees. Uh, this, these plants have been found like this all the way going back to the time of the dinosaurs. And there's still about 200 species of them worldwide. This one is actually an exotic example here from the Botanical Gardens collection from South Africa. But if I stand up and you look over here behind me, right over there, we have some native ones. Before settling on making a botanical garden as a way to make a living, the Wilson family that established this botanical garden thought of creating a tea plantation using the already cleared land that was here. And behind me are some examples of the tea plants that they planted. Now, unfortunately, or I guess we could say fortunately, because we wouldn't have this botanical garden, the climate here isn't very favorable to growing tea. The, the plants themselves grow fantastically, but because of the soil, humidity, temperatures, and other factors, the tea tasted downright terrible. So as a result, they ended up shifting focus and created a botanical garden. But some of the original tea plants are still here and you can check them out. Over here is another introduced exotic species to the botanical gardens. And it's hard to see how tall these palm trees are, but you can get an idea there. These are the second tallest palm trees in the world. And these were brought over in the 1970s from Papua New Guinea. But it's incredible how despite their tall, how tall they are, that even in a strong wind and the storm, they're incredibly flexible and they don't fall over. So we've made it to our second spot for the trip. 
the beautiful Corcovado National Park. You can see the welcome sign right here behind me. Now we're already about one kilometer inland. We came in by boat. It was about an hour and a half boat ride around the southern tip of the Osa Peninsula. And we got here to the Serena Ranger Station, which is the ranger station in the very middle of the park. Now behind me, you can see there's a lot of open grassland and that's because what's right behind me actually used to be an airfield uh, and it's currently still maintained as one by the civil aviation authorities. It's no longer used, but they do keep the trees back from the edge of the field in case uh, perhaps an emergency or a future use, they might have a need for it. This is a very special place because this is the most biologically intense place on earth. It's been said by National Geographic. Uh, there are so many bird species here, tree species. There's more species of trees in this small national park than all of the continental US and Canada combined. This is the uh, place with the largest jaguar population uh, still found in Central America. So it's a very important place for conservation and we're going to see what we're able to find over the next three days here. Here we've got one of the coolest trees in Corcovado. This is a type of acacia tree that's only found in the South Pacific of Costa Rica. But what makes it special is the symbiotic relationship it has with a species of ants. In fact, all the types of acacia tree that you find in Costa Rica have their own species of, we could say, protective bodyguard of ants. But what happens is this tree, the ants live all along it. I'm not gonna touch them because they bite very hard. But then this plant has these thorns and the thorns have a hole in them. And that's where the ants make their nest. They don't dig a, a mound in the ground like you normally associate with ants. They actually live in this. And the ants produce pheromones that tell the tree to start making these thorns. Conversely, the relationship helps the tree because these ants will bite anything that comes on the tree. Often they'll even uh, clear out the forest floor around the base of the tree to prevent things competing with this plant. And they will also protect it from other species that might try to come and eat the leaves, things like that. Another interesting fact is when this tree flowers and needs pollinated, the ants will also unfortunately attack the pollinators. They're not that smart. But what the plant does is it produces nectar down here along the leaves and the stem, and it distracts the ants. The ants are busy collecting the nectar that has all the food they need, all the nutrients, amino acids, and thus the bees can come in and pollinate the flowers, which the trees still need. They're plants, they need pollinated. So these are really cool plants that you can find here only in the South Pacific of Costa Rica. Now I'm here where the Serena River meets the Pacific Ocean. Fun fact, Serena means mermaid in Spanish. So we're staying at the Mermaid Ranger Station and here we have the Mermaid River. Now the ocean part of the national park is one you don't really explore that much. You come in by boat, but you're generally in land. But as a national park and as a conservation uh, initiative or as part of the conservation of the national park, the ocean is very important. Four species of endangered sea turtles nest on the beaches in Corcovado National Park and they live obviously in the ocean. In fact, the females after they're born, they leave the beaches, go out into the ocean, and that's the only time they'll ever return to land. The males will never return to land. In addition to sea turtles, there's also several species of dolphins, whales. In total, there's about 25 species of cetaceans that live in the marine part of the national park. Costa Rica has really been working towards a global goal that is trying to protect 30% of the world's oceans. And Costa Rica reached that target recently uh, when they expanded the protected area around Cocos Island National Park, which is about a couple hundred kilometers off the coast that way. But in terms of near shore protection, Corcovado is one of the most important protected areas in continental Costa Rica. So we're here on our second day and we're walking over towards the old growth forest. We've seen a lot of cool things over here. The video quality today might be a little bit uh, worse than normal because it's dark for one, but it's also started raining. The rainy season really starts around this time of year and we're here for the very first significant rainfall of the year. Although it's been a rainy dry season, uh, the rainy season is definitely hitting today. So because of the weather, the lack of light, I'm just recording with my phone for the time being. But I still have a lot of cool things to show you even if the quality is not quite as high. The birds are really happy though that the rainy season has started. Just take a listen to them. In particular, there's a lot of parrots calling right now. They're really enjoying this uh, fresh rain. So now I'm standing at the base of a probably three to 500 year old tree. And this is a wild cashew tree. There's actually another one right over there. 
It's the same exact genus as the tree that we get the cashews from you'd buy at the supermarket. Just the domestic ones, it's a lot easier to get. They tend to grow a lot shorter. But these that are a couple hundred years old are a great source of food for monkeys. Uh, you might not know this if you're from a, a country where you just get cashews from the supermarket that have already been salted and processed. But the cashew is actually a fruit and it has the nut on top that's the seed. And so the fruit is also eaten here in Central America. And the monkeys love to eat the fruit. So these trees are really beautiful to see because they're just ginormous. It's, it's hard to show on video the scale of them, but it, it really makes you appreciate how beautiful these old growth forests are that we've unfortunately lost so much of and how great it is to visit places that you can still see them. Right here is a really cool stone. And I wanna have you guess, how did you end up with a stone with an almost perfect circle hole in the middle of it? I'll give you a hint. The origin is volcanic. These stones were formed when a volcano erupted here a very long time ago, and it came down through the forest and encapsulated all the trees. Over time, eventually the trees, since they're organic, rotted away and disintegrated. And what was left is the old trunks in the middle of these rocks. So there's a ton of rocks through here that are all hollow, and it's uh, because of their volcanic origins and the, how they came down through this forest. Here we've got a great Tinamou. This is the largest of five Tinamous that we have here in Costa Rica. They are in the same general part of the bird family as like ostriches, emus. They're pretty much flightless birds. Uh, they basically look like giant meat sacks. It's a miracle that they're, <laughs> they're still around given how many things that would like to eat them are here in the forest. But they make an absolutely beautiful call that we're awoken to very early in the morning. In fact, I heard them start calling at about three o'clock this morning. Well, it's our third and final day here in Corcovado at the Serena Ranger Station. We've got to catch our boat back out at around 1230 to head back up in the mountains. I just wanted to give you a little show of what it's like staying here at a ranger station way out in the middle of the jungle. At the front where you come in, you've got this beautiful wide open porch where you can sit, take in the amazing views from outside the park. And this is also where the offices for the park ranger station are. And there's a little shop where you can buy some fruit juice and things like that. The building's kind of laid out in a square. Our beds were right over there at the corner of that pod, the far corner. And there's two sections of bedrooms, one here and one over there. And then in between down there are the bathrooms. And over there you have the dining area. You can't bring in your own food. So uh, every day for breakfast, lunch and dinner, we go over there and get our food from the uh, local uh, developmental organization that's in charge of preparing the food here. The Corcovado leg of the trip was definitely a success. We saw pretty much everything we wanted to see. The endangered white lip peccaries, the Baird's tapir. Uh, we also saw most of the birds that I had on my list that I wanted to see. And so now we're getting ready to head out from sea level and super hot up into the mountains where it's going to be a lot cooler. Well, with our last second change of plans, I got to come to one of my favorite spots in Costa Rica. We're up here in the highlands at about 2,600 meters above sea level at Paraiso Quetzal Lodge. This is a essential stopping spot for anybody coming to Costa Rica for wildlife photography because it's a great spot to see so many of the endemic highland bird species that we have in Costa Rica. I've seen four endemic hummingbird species and a couple other things like a sooty thrush, which is a beautiful blackbird with a yellow beak and blue eyes. You probably can't tell how beautiful it is right now because when it's foggy like this, which often happens in the cloud forest, the camera just can't capture it. It just looks all white. But you have some beautiful mist rolling through the, the uh, trees. It, you hear the songs of the birds. It's cool. It's about uh, 10 degrees, 12 degrees uh, Celsius right now. It's about what mid 50s Fahrenheit. And it's a beautiful spot to be. So filming some hummingbirds. Hope you enjoyed the footage. Now we're up at the trails behind the Savegre Hotel, and these are some virgin forests 
here in the highlands of Costa Rica. We're at about 2,400 meters or about 8,000 feet above sea level. And so the type of forests we have here are completely different from earlier in our trip where we were in lowland Pacific rainforest. Here, this is a type of cloud forest. And really what a cloud forest is, elevation plays a big factor in it. But the main criteria for cloud forest is how much really clouds you get. So the moisture, rather than exclusively falling by rain and a little bit of ambient humidity, you get a lot of clouds, fog, things like that, that permit uh, the plants to get nutrients and to get especially the water they need at a higher level. Because trees can only pump so far, they don't have mechanical uh, electric pumps to get the water up to the tallest parts. In fact, that's the same reason that the giant redwoods in like California are able to grow. It's because of the high moisture content in the air. They don't have to pump the water all the way up from their roots. But as a side effect of that, the trees themselves uh, have things growing on them, a lot of things growing on on them. At, at times it can be tons of biomass on the branches of trees. So if we look at this tree behind me that's fallen here, you can see some interesting things about it. And you can see we have a lot of, for example, mosses. And obviously moss, it, this, this almost weighs nothing. It feels like a feather. But then we also have things like lichens, bromeliads, and you can see up there a larger tree that, that's fallen as well next to this one that's right here. And the cumulative effect of all of this mass, especially on branches that grow out the side like this, is that the trees are under a lot of stress. Not in a bad way, it's part of the natural system here. This is how uh, you get so such variety, biodiversity in the highlands, a high number of endemic species. And this has a positive effect. So if you look up there in the forest, you can see it's all in the shade. But where this tree has recently fallen, we have sun. And so this permits a new generation of trees and plants to grow up. Whereas in a lowland tropical forest, it's very dark and there's rare opportunities for new plants to, to grow. Here, there's constant regeneration, constant changing of the forest, because trees falling is a very common and natural part of the ecosystem. And it's important because as they decompose, they provide both habitats for new animals to make nests, to take advantage of the fallen material. Uh, the decomposing provides nutrients for the soil. And then also things like insects that are maybe eating the dead uh, wood, uh, taking advantage of that ecosystem, become food for the birds that are living in these still standing trees. So it's all part of a healthy uh, cloud forest ecosystem. So right behind me are a pair of resplendent quetzals, and they're here for a specific reason. It's for this fruit. There's over 40 species of wild avocado found here in Costa Rica. You can see the fruit right here. It's a lot tinier than what you buy at the supermarket. And this fruit has quite a lot less flesh than what you would get at the supermarket as well. You can see I'm peeling it here with my finger. It's almost entirely seed. There's just a thin layer of meat on top of it. And the quetzals have a throat that's specially designed for eating these avocados. They fly in, grab the fruit as a whole, swallow it, and they have specialized muscles in their esophagus that allow them to completely peel the fruit in their esophagus. And then after they have two or three seeds processed, they'll regurgitate the seeds and the fruit will remain in their stomach. For our last stop of the trip, we're here in the Los Quetzales National Park up in the highlands of Costa Rica on the Sierra de la Muerte. This is our last morning. We've actually already been out for a couple hours looking for another few highland endemic species. I'm on a road here that actually transects the national park and so we're looking at birds along the side of the road. One particularly exciting bird that we were able to hear and briefly see, but not photograph this morning, is known as the rent thrush. And it's the bird that represents Costa Rica's Ornithological Society because its scientific name pays homage to Costa Rica's first native um, ornithologist, a man by the last name of Celedon. So there's actually uh, a couple birds named after him. There's Zeladon's antbird, but also the rent thrush, its scientific name uh, includes his name, Zeladonia, in its name. So that was really exciting to see. But I think this is going to be the last video. So I just wanted to say thank you for joining me along on this journey. Subscribe if you'd like to see more uh, trips and information about wildlife here in Costa Rica. And have a great day.